today, we are going to talk about serial killers from a profession that you would not expect. These people are considered experts on the frailties of the human body. Any guesses as to what their profession was and what weapons they used? Welcome back to Mysterious Hook, where we shed light on under-the-radar cases. My name is Matt. Without further ado, let's get started. Horton Mudgett, alias Holmes, was born on May 16, 1861, to Levi Horton Mudgett and Theodate Page Price. At a very young age, he was subjected to abuse by his father, and he used to vent his anger by torturing animals. He was married at the very young age of 16 and had his first child with his first wife, Clara Lovering. Holmes was having a happy, normal life until he entered college. He was 18 years old in 1882 when he entered the University of Michigan's Department of Medicine and Surgery. He graduated in June 1884. After passing his exams, Holmes enrolled himself in the Department of Medicine and Surgery. He then worked in the anatomy lab under Professor William James Herdman. The chief anatomy instructor and Holmes were said to be engaged in facilitating grave robbing to supply medical cadavers. They were also making fake insurance claims on behalf of cadavers while mutilating and presenting them as victims of accidents. Holmes decided to be on the move all the time. Just before his family thought of stability, Holmes abandoned his family and moved to New York. While he was in New York, he was suspected of the murder of two boys. One boy disappeared after he was last seen with Holmes, while the other died after consuming some medicine that Holmes had given him. The police were gathering evidence against Holmes, and he was arrested when he tried to collect $20,000 in fake insurance on a cadaver. But the police did not charge him with murder, as there was no proof against him. While the actual identity of Holmes as Mudgett was getting noticed, Mudgett moved to Chicago. In August 1886, after moving there, he changed his name to H.H. H. Holmes. When he came across Elizabeth S. Holton's drugstore at the northwest corner of South Wallace Avenue and West 63rd Street in Englewood, Holton gave Holmes a job, and he proved to be a hard-working employee, eventually buying the store. Holmes purchased an empty lot across from the drugstore, which was later called Murder Castle. Many claims were made that the structure contained secret torture chambers, trap doors, gas chambers, and a basement crematorium where many victims suffered painful deaths. Holmes actually lured his victims into the hotel, then took them to the torture chambers and sliced his victims open. Holmes then sold the vitals for a hefty sum of money and dissolved the remains in a concentrated acid in the basement. While he was doing such a job, he met Julia, who was married and had a daughter. Julia started having an affair with Holmes without realizing his mental condition. Understanding the affair, Julia's husband left her, so she started living in Murder Castle and soon disappeared along with her daughter. Meanwhile, Holmes was arrested in a fraud case. Holmes was subjected to a short jail term, and that was when Holmes met a convict named Mario Hedgepath. When they were in jail, they both struck up a plan to fake an insurance policy for $10,000, where Holmes would pretend to be dead. This plan failed miserably. Holmes then met his acquaintance, Peitzel, who agreed to fake his own death so that Mrs. Peitzel could collect $10,000 as a life insurance policy, which she was to split with Holmes. Peitzel had to set himself up as an inventor under the name B.F. Perry, and then be murdered and disfigured in a lab explosion. Holmes had to find an appropriate cadaver to play the role of Peitzel. Instead, Holmes got greedy and murdered Peitzel by knocking him unconscious with chloroform and setting his body on fire using benzene. Holmes then collected $10,000 in the name of Peitzel. 
However, he manipulated Peitzel's unsuspecting wife by getting three of her five children, named Alice, Nellie, and Howard, placed in his custody. He later murdered Alice and Nellie by forcing them into a large trunk and locking them inside. He drilled a hole in the lid of the trunk and put one end of a hose through the hole, attaching the other end to a gas line to asphyxiate the girls. Mrs. Peitzel then reported to the police that her kids hadn't returned in a while. That is when the police started looking for the missing children along with Holmes. But when the police reached his hotel, they found the boy dead in the chimney. It seemed like the boy was being chopped up. On November 17, 1894, Holmes's murder spree ended after he was held on an outstanding warrant for horse theft. And after that, police became more suspicious. In October 1895, Holmes was put on trial for the murder of Benjamin Peitzel and was found guilty of 27 murders and sentenced to death. On May 7, Holmes was hanged at Moya Mensing Prison, also known as the Philadelphia County Prison for the murder of Peitzel. Until the moment of his death, Holmes remained calm and amiable, showing very few signs of fear, anxiety, or depression. Walter J. Freeman was born on November 14, 1895, and raised by his parents in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Freeman's grandfather, William Williams Keene, was well known as a surgeon in the Civil War. His father was also a very successful doctor. Freeman attended Yale University in 1912 and graduated in 1916. He then moved on to study neurology at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. The Swiss specialist Gottlieb Burkhardt was the first to attempt human psychosurgery, which was performed during the 10 years of the 1880s through the 1890s. Exploratory raids were generally restricted at that point, and in the next many years, psychosurgery was tried, but irregularly. On November 12, 1935, another psychosurgery strategy was performed in Portugal by the nervous system specialist, Dr. Igis Moniz. His new leucotomy technique was planned to treat psychological instability by taking little corings of the patient's cerebrum. Moniz turned into a tutor and icon for Freeman, who changed the system and renamed it to the lobotomy. Rather than taking corings from the cerebrum, Freeman's method cut off the association between the cerebrum and the thalamus. Since Walter Freeman was a nervous system specialist and not a neurosurgeon, he enrolled with the assistance of neurosurgeon James Watts. One year after the primary lobotomy, on September 14, 1936, Freeman coordinated Watts to the absolute first prefrontal lobotomy in the United States on a homemaker, Alice Hood Hammett of Topeka, Kansas. Freeman and Watts had previously dealt with 20 cases, including a few additional tasks. By 1942, the team had performed more than 200 lobotomies and had distributed results proving 63% of patients had improved. 23% were accounted for to be unaltered, and 14% were more regrettable after a medical procedure. After 10 years of lobotomy, Freeman found out about a specialist in Italy named Amaro Fiamberti, who worked on the cerebrum through his patient's eye sockets, allowing him to get to the mind without penetrating through the skull. Taking motivation, Freeman formed another system, called the transorbital lobotomy. This new system was known as the ice pick lobotomy, and it was performed by embedding a metal pick into the edge of each eye socket while pounding it through the meager bone there with a hammer and moving it in to and fro, cutting off the associations with the prefrontal cortex and the cerebrum of the mind. The transorbital lobotomy medical procedure was first performed in Washington, D.C., on a homemaker named Sally Ellen Ionesco by Walter. This transorbital lobotomy strategy didn't need a neurosurgeon and could be performed outside of a working room without using sedation 
by applying electroconvulsive treatment to insight seizures. The adjustments to his lobotomy had Freeman expand this medical procedure. Transorbital lobotomy could be done in mental emergency clinics all over the U.S., which were overpopulated and understaffed at that point. In 1950, Walter Freeman's long-lasting accomplice, James Watts, passed on their training and split from Freeman because of his resistance to the savagery and abuse of the transorbital lobotomy. This practice often left patients in a vegetative state or diminished their quality of life, making their behavior similar to a child's. Freeman took the lives of 490 individuals during the procedures. Freeman took the recently changed method to the public in his van, which he named his lobotomobile. He would show the medical procedure to specialists working at the state-run organizations. In some cases, he would start ice-picking both eye sockets at once, with an ice pick in each hand. His most famous medical procedure was performed on Rosemary Kennedy, who was the sister of John F. Kennedy. She was left in a vegetative state at age 23 for the rest of her life. One of his previous patients, Howard Doley, proceeded to compose the book, My Lobotomy, examining his involvement in the system at age 12. Freeman allowed the media to watch an operation in which a patient died when the ice pick slipped into their mind. He was noted for acting carelessly as he moved from patient to patient. His permit was canceled after the death of a patient. And although most doctors would measure risk, Walter was eccentrically risky. The Soviet Union was the first to ban lobotomy on moral grounds. Germany and Japan followed them. The U.S. also banned lobotomy, but only in some states, as the introduction of Thorazine proved to be a better cure for patients. Freeman would do his last lobotomy on his longtime patient, Helen Mortensen, who died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Freeman retired from George Washington University and started his practice at the age of 57. Walter Freeman II died of cancer in the year 1972, but all of the deaths he caused were due to fame. The hunt for fame took the lives of many people or left them in a vegetative state. Was Freeman not akin to a criminal? Well, it is up to us to decide. Michael Swango was born in Tacoma, Washington and brought up in Quincy, Illinois. He was the middle child of Muriel and John Virgil Swango. Swango's dad worked as a United States Army officer who served in the Vietnam War. The war made Swango's dad an alcoholic, which caused Muriel to divorce him. Growing up, Swango saw little of his dad and therefore was closer to his mom. He was the valedictorian of his 1972 Quincy Catholic Boys High School class. Swango served in the Marine Corps, graduating from recruitment training at the Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego. He saw no war abroad during his administration, so he got a respectable release in 1980. Preparing with the Marines made him love physical fitness. While he was not studying, he was often seen running or performing exercises on the Quincy University grounds. He used to do push-ups as a type of self-discipline when he was criticized by his teachers. Swango graduated from Quincy University as a chemical engineer with the highest praise. He was given the American Chemical Society Award, and following his graduation, Swango went to clinical school at the Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. Swango's fascination with chemicals increased during his time at Southern Illinois University, which led him to have dangerous behaviors. Although he was a splendid student, he liked to function as an ambulance attendant as opposed to focusing on his examinations. A distinct fascination with patients' deaths was seen during this time. People didn't see that many of Swango's allotted patients had experienced dangerous health conditions, and five of them died. Despite an extremely unfortunate assessment in his senior member's letter from SIU, 
Swango acquired a careful temporary job at Ohio State University Medical Center in 1983. While he worked in Rhodes Hall at OSU, medical caretakers observed that healthy patients started dying when Swango had been the floor assistant. One medical caretaker found him injecting some medication into a patient who later turned out to be unusually sick, but the caretaker wasn't fully sure of what was going on. The caretaker mistook it for regular medication, but increased suspicions led Swango back to Quincy. In July of 1984, Swango got back to Quincy and started functioning as an emergency medical technician with the Adams County Ambulance Corps. Many of the paramedics on staff started to notice that whenever Swango arranged the coffee or got any food, a few of them would fall sick for no obvious reason. In October of that year, the Quincy Police Department was tipped off about Swango by his colleague. The police found arsenic and different toxins in his possession. On August 23, 1985, the court sentenced Swango to five years imprisonment for harming colleagues. After his release in 1989, Swango got a new line of work as a lab professional for ATI Coal and Newport News, currently known as Vanguard Energy, a division of CITA Logistics. During his time there, employees experienced stomach aches in his presence. At or close to this time, Swango met Kristen Lynn Kinney, a medical caretaker at Riverside Hospital. The couple fell in love and wanted to marry once they got settled. But Kristen wouldn't know that his only desire was to murder people, which wasn't going to end anytime soon. He worked there until 1991. Then he left his position to search for another opportunity as a specialist. He kept moving from job to job to avoid any detection of his murderous intentions. He made sure that he didn't stick to one job for too long, as he was starting to attract people's attention. Most states won't give a clinical permit to a person with a criminal record. So, he forged a reclamation of civil rights letter from Virginia Governor Gerald L. Bayless, stating that his voting rights had been restored due to the reports from companions and partners stating his great behavior. The American Medical Association briefly forgot about Swango when he got into the psychiatric residency program at the Stony Brook University School of Medicine in New York. Yet again, his patients started dying for no reason. After four months, Kristen committed suicide, and arsenic was found in her body. The police were alerted, and they started getting all the details about the sudden death. And the police launched a criminal investigation. Before the police could get a hold of him, Swango had already escaped the country. In November 1994, Swango moved to Zimbabwe and utilized forged reports to get some work at Neen Luther Mission Hospital. Once again, his patients started dying. On account of doubts, Dr. Zashiri, the clinical chief, suspended Swango. Confronted with hard proof of his fake reports and the prospect of a lengthy investigation into his time in Zimbabwe, Swango was charged with cheating the public authorities in March 1998. In July of 1998, he was sentenced to three and a half years in jail. The judge ordered that Swango should not be allowed to plan or convey food or have any contribution. On September 6, 2000, he confessed to the three homicide counts, as well as counts of wire misrepresentation and mail fraud, under the watchful eye of Judge Jacob Mishler. At his sentencing, Swango confessed to having caused three homicides, lying about his job in causing the fourth demise, and lying about his 1985 conviction. Investigators read explicit entries from Swango's book, which expressed the joy he felt during his killing spree. Judge Mishler sentenced Swanko to three successive life terms with no parole. Shipman was born on January 14, 1946, 
on the Bestwood Estate, a board domain in Nottingham, Nottinghamshire. He was the second of three children of Harold Frederick Shipman, a transporter, and Vera Britz. His parents were faithful Methodists. While growing up, Shipman was a rugby player in youth associations. Shipman turned 11 in 1957, moving to High Pavement Grammar School, Nottingham, which he left in 1964. He succeeded as a distance sprinter during his last year at school. Shipman was exceptionally close to his mom, but unfortunately she was suffering from lung cancer when Shipman was just 17. In the latter phases of her sickness, she was given morphine by a specialist. Shipman saw his mom's pain decrease despite her terminal condition. Shipman's mom died on June 21, 1963. On November 5, 1966, Shipman married Primrose May Oxtaby, and the couple had four daughters. Shipman pursued medicine at Leeds School of Medicine, University of Leeds, graduating in 1970. He started working at Pontefract General Infirmary and Pontefract West Riding of Yorkshire. Shipman was in a rush to make money, so he discovered how to manufacture solutions of pethidine for his utilization, for which he was fined 600 pounds, and momentarily went to a medication recovery facility in York, England. He qualified as a general practitioner at the Donnybrook Medical Center in Hyde, close to Manchester, in 1977. Shipman kept functioning as a GP in Hyde all through the 1980s and laid out his medical procedures at 21 Market Street in 1993, turning him into a regarded individual in the local area. But nobody in the locality could guess how that fame would be a potential axis of many murders to come. In March 1998, Linda Reynolds of Brook Surgery in Hyde told John Pollard, the coroner for the South Manchester District, about the high death rate among Shipman's patients. Coroner John Pollard asked the police to investigate, but the police couldn't track down sufficient proof and shut down their investigation on April 17th. Shipman murdered three more people after the failed investigation. A cab driver named John Shaw let the police know that he had identified Shipman for murdering 21 patients. Shaw became suspicious as a number of the senior clients he took to the medical clinic, who appeared to be healthy, died in Shipman's care. Shipman's time as a GP was coming to a close. His last casualty was Kathleen Grundy, who was announced dead at her home on June 24, 1998. Shipman was the last person to see her alive. He later marked her passing testament, expressing the reason for her death as advanced age. Grundy's little girl, legal counselor Angela Woodruff, became concerned when specialist Brian Burgess informed her that a will had been made by her mom and the will barred Woodruff and her children from claiming Grundy's wealth. But Grundy left £386,000 to Shipman. At Burgess's recommendation, Woodruff went to the police, who started an examination. When Grundy's body was uncovered, it was found to contain hints of diamorphine, heroin. And the police assessment of his computer uncovered that the medical records were created after her demise. Shipman was then captured on September 7, 1998. The police examined the deaths of different people who died under Shipman's care. The police explored 15 explicit cases against them. They found evidence of him issuing deadly dosages of heroin, marking patients as dead, and making wrong clinical records later that showed their chronic weakness. Shipman was presented at Preston Crown Court on October 5, 1999. He was accused of the murders of 15 ladies by deadly injections of diamorphine, all somewhere in the range of 1995 and 1998. The casualties were Marie West, Irene Turner, Lizzie Adams, Jean Lilly, Ivy Thomas, Muriel Grisham, Marie Quinn, 
Kathleen Wagstaff, Bianca Pomfret, Nora Natal, Pamela Hilly, Maureen Ward, Winifred Meller, Joan Melia, Kathleen Grundy. Shipman's lawyers attempted to isolate the Grundy case from the others. On January 31st, 2000, following six days of thought, the jury found Shipman to be liable for 15 counts of homicide and one count of imitation. Mr. Justice Forbes then condemned Shipman to life imprisonment on every one of the 15 counts of homicide. He was never released, while simultaneously he was charged with a punishment of four years for forging Grundy's will. Shipman reliably denied his involvement, questioning the logical proof against him. Shipman's wife Primrose supported her husband's innocence even after his conviction. Shipman was the only medical professional throughout the entire existence of British medicine who was responsible for intentionally murdering his patients. Harold Frederick Shipman, referred to by colleagues as Fred Shipman, was an English general specialist who was viewed as the most prolific serial killer in modern history, with an expected 250 casualties. On January 31st, 2000, Shipman was seen as at fault for the homicide of 15 patients under his care. He was condemned to life imprisonment with the suggestion that he serve an entire lifetime. Shipman hanged himself in his cell at H.M. Prison Wakefield at 6.20 a.m. on January 13th, 2004, the night before his 58th birthday. He was declared dead at 8.10 a.m. A declaration from the Queen's Prison Service showed that he had hung himself from the window bars of his cell using his bedsheets. Adams was born and raised in Randallstown, Ulster, Ireland, he was born into a family of Plymouth Brethren, an austere Protestant sect of which he remained a member for his entire life. His father Samuel was a preacher in the local congregation and a professional watchmaker. He also had a passion for cars which he would pass on to Adams. In 1896, when Samuel was 39 years old, he married Ellen Bodkin, age 30. Adams was their first son, followed by a younger brother, William Samuel, in 1903. In 1914, Samuel Adams died of a stroke. Four years later, William Samuel died in the 1918 influenza pandemic. This loss affected Adams gravely, but he still continued to pursue his education. In 1921, Surgeon Arthur Rendell Short offered Adams a position as an assistant houseman at Bristol Royal Infirmary. He spent a year there but did not prove to be a success. On Short's advice, Adams applied for a job as a general practitioner in Christian practice in Eastbourne, Sussex, and got the job. Adam moved to Eastbourne in 1922 to work as a general practitioner. Eastbourne was one of the wealthiest places. Gertrude Hollett, a member of the Eastbourne locality, had been depressed since the death of her husband. Adam was the one who treated her. Mrs. Hollett expressed her wish to commit suicide, which was when Adams prescribed sodium barbitone to relieve her pain and suffering. Grateful for the attention she received, she wrote a check for £1,000 on July 17th. 1956, which Adams met his banker and ordered him to cash the check in a single day instead of seven days to avoid any suspicion. The following day, Hollett took an overdose of sodium barbitone and fell into a coma. Dr. Harris attended her without the notice of Dr. Adams. Adams met with Harris and they both declared the condition a brain hemorrhage. A pathologist came to collect the samples from her stomach to rule out the possibility of narcotic poisoning, which both doctors deemed unnecessary. Hollett was alive, and Adams contacted a coroner to examine her. He declared that she had bronchopneumonia and had died on July 23, 1956. A post-mortem was done on her, and the coroner found large quantities of sodium barbitone in her stomach. Before there could be an investigation, Adams gave suicide as the reason on her death certificate and cremated her, 
leaving no trace of evidence. Mrs. Hollett had left a Rolls-Royce Silver Dawn in her will for Adams, written just five days before she died, and Adams became the wealthiest GP in all of England. The police then received an anonymous call, indicating the deaths of many of Adams' patients were foul play. Then the case was passed on to Hannum. Hannum also noticed that the cases Adams dealt with could well point towards foul play due to the number of people who left their wills for Adams. So he decided to check the 132 cases that left Adams with wills. Hannum decided to check out the case of Edith Morrell, which happened eight years earlier. Edith Morrell left a Rolls-Royce silver ghost, chest of silver cutlery, and a large cash bequest for Adams in her will. It was also clear that Adams paid for 1,100 visits, charging her 1,654 pounds, almost three times a day. It was very hard to convict Adams with that evidence because it had happened eight years previously, and the technology wasn't good enough to retrace the evidence. So Hannum decided to interrogate the doctors of Eastbound. Surprisingly, the British Medical Association sent a letter to all the doctors in Eastbound to maintain the confidentiality of their practice. Hannum got very frustrated, so he contacted Reginald Manningham Buller, to write a letter to BMA to revoke the confidentiality clause. But no response was heard, so Buller visited the secretary of the BMA. Then Buller passed the investigation report of 187 pages on Adams to the secretary. Hannum was pretty upset about the interference of the BMA, so Hannum visited Adams and interrogated him while he answered all the questions perfectly. He discovered Adams hiding two bottles of narcotics in his pockets, which led to Adams' arrest. Adams was presented in court, where the judge Roland Gwynn suggested that Hannum could only convict Adams of a single case. If that wasn't proven, then all the other charges were to be dropped. Hannum couldn't prove it, but Hannum somehow got hold of the check for £1,000 written in the name of Adams as proof, and just before the hearing, the check disappeared. Officer Seekings was responsible for the disappearance. Hannum later discovered that Roland Gwynn and Officer Seekings were both lovers of Adams. Adams' first trial received worldwide press coverage and was described as one of the greatest murder trials of all time, as well as the murder trial of the century. The trial also had several important legal changes. It established the doctrine of double effect, whereby a doctor giving treatment to relieve pain may lawfully, as an unintentional result, shorten life. Secondly, because of the publicity surrounding Adams, the law was changed to allow defendants to ask for such hearings to be held in private. A lot of people in society knew for sure that Adams was the one responsible for all the murders, but the media could not attack Adams without the court's confirmation. So, they published their opinions in the form of poems. Although Adams was charged with 13 convictions, none of them proved to be valid. In 2003, his file was reopened, but they could not convict Adams due to a lack of proof and evidence. It was hard to convict because all of his patients were old people with some existing medical conditions. As doctors were allowed to use narcotics to relieve the pain of their patients, it was impossible to check how much dosage was issued by Adams. If Adams was convicted of using narcotics on patients, then they would have to convict all doctors. It is estimated that Adams murdered over 300 people. The only British doctor ever convicted of murder was Harold Shipman. And this was the list of doctors who chose to provide death instead of life-saving services. Some did it for money, while others did it for pleasure. What do you want the doctors to be? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section, and don't forget to like, share, and hit the subscribe button for more in-depth coverage of some of the most compelling cases on Mysterious Hook.